DW Inside Europe. Hello and welcome. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. On today's programme, the first but not last elections special of this elections bumper year. Portugal first. Chega, chega, chega, chega, chega, chega. Followed by, now, what was that country called again? Oh, yes, it was Russia. One day I will vote in a Russia where there is free speech, where journalists are not persecuted, where there are no uh, fabricated criminal cases that precede presidential elections in order to teach everyone a lesson. Stay with us. There is a lot to discuss. The sound of Portuguese politician André Ventura and members of his fledgling radical right party, Chega, celebrating in Lisbon on Sunday. They'd not won the election. It was a centre-right coalition that won a narrow victory over their socialist rivals. But nevertheless, Chega's dramatic surge, going from just 12 seats in 2022 to 48 in 2024, now representing some 18% of the vote, was the real news of the night in a country which, until recently, had been believed to have been immune to the right-wing populism shaking up politics elsewhere in Europe. So, what exactly has just happened in Portugal and what does it mean for the country and beyond? For answers, I turned to Luca Manucci from the University of Lisbon's Institute of Social Sciences and author of the books Populism and Collective Memory and The Populism Interviews. Well, yeah, there was the idea that Portugal was, let's say, vaccinated against the uh, authoritarian tendencies and the populist radical right that we see around the globe. The assumption was always wrong because no country is immune to the populist radical right. The fact is the electorate for such a party, for Stega, for example, has been there all this time. What was lacking was a credible supply, meaning that People who would have liked to vote a party like Chega existed already back in the 70s. What was lacking was a party with democratic credentials that people could vote. And this happened only in 2019. Uh, There are several reasons why this happened only in 2019. For example, Chega has been different compared to all the other populist radical right parties that came before in several regards. For example, Andre Ventura, the leader of the party, belonged to the mainstream right. PSD. So uh, already when he founded Chega, uh, he had democratic credentials that most other populist radical right leaders before him didn't have. Uh, Another thing that Ventura had uh, was a really high visibility in the media. Uh, This is due to the fact that he was already a football commentator for several years on Portuguese television. So he was a known face to the public. Uh, These two things combined for sure helped a lot to get to enter the parliament in 2019 and to become the third biggest party uh, as it is now. So, I mean, his personal appeal as a, as a media figure and as a political leader is obviously a big factor. What, what are the other factors that are contributing to Chega's rise? Well, we've been studying the electorate of Chega uh, since it was created in 2019. Um, and of course, the electorate of Sega has dramatically expanded over the last five years. It grew from a little bit more than 1% of the votes to almost 20%. Um, but uh, there are some characteristics of the electorate of Sega that are quite constant. For example, we know that those who vote Sega, so the populist radical right in Portugal, are citizens who are dissatisfied with the way democracy works in the country, uh, are people against the political system built o- over the last 50 years, uh, are citizens concerned with issues such as immigration and corruption, uh, who want law and order, opposed multiculturalism and women's rights. Uh, and in terms of social demographic characteristics, we know that the electorate of Chega is composed mostly of young men uh, with low education level. And another factor identified by yourself and your colleagues in a, a survey that you conducted last year was the levels of nostalgia for authoritarianism. Perhaps you could take me through your findings. So what I did is to form uh, survey items that are new and that are innovative and that were never used before 
And I literally ask Portuguese people and Spanish people uh, what they think about the authoritarian past, about Franco, about Salazar, about the way in which Spain and Portugal transitioned to democracy. And of course, I cross all of these questions to, with other, uh, with other characteristics of the citizens, such as the party for which they vote. So uh, I found some, some interesting findings. For example, um, the Shega and Vox voters are much more likely to agree with the fact that Franco and Salazar were among the best statesmen in the history of Portugal and Spain. They're also particularly convinced that their countries after the, the democratic transitions of the mid seventies had lost the strong community links that tied them together. Similarly, they're much more likely to think that Spain and Portugal were better during the dictatorships because they were based on traditional values and national identities. Uh, so Chega and Vox voters believe that we lost some freedoms that were permitted by their respective dictatorships. Uh, finally, Vox and Chega voters are convinced that looking back at the authoritarian past is the best recipe for the future. Indeed, they are much more likely to believe that if politicians followed the ideas of Franco and Salazar today, Spain and Portugal would regain their place in the international arena. Hmm. That's really interesting, that projection of the past into the future. Um, I'm wondering, Luca, you personally, if you were to look at the past and take a lesson from Portugal's past with you into the future, what, what would it be? I think that Portugal's past shows that even the most stable authoritarian regimes collapse when they don't have popular support. Moreover, I think Portugal's past shows that people learn from the past and form collective memories to build the future. The past 50 years of Portugal have been built upon the memory of 48 years of right-wing authoritarian dictatorship and the necessity to avoid repeating the same mistakes. However, looking in perspective, I think Portuguese past also sends as a warning. Uh, democracy is not given once and for all. It is something that has to be protected and built day by day. Uh, currently around the world, illiberal parties are eroding liberal democratic principles. And one of the reasons is that we have forgotten what the authoritarian past looked like. Uh, we have to keep the memory alive without emptying it of its life, of its meaning. It cannot just be a rhetorical and institutional celebration because otherwise the next generation won't have any interest in keeping this memory alive. And I believe that the fact that Chega is so strong among the young electorate might be a signal of precisely this phenomenon. I think young people in Portugal do not have any personal memory of the dictatorship, of course, but what has been lost is the intergenerational transmission of this collective memory. And this is a warning that's, of course, really important for the rest of Europe as we head towards crucial European elections. What sort of lessons do you think that uh, the democratically minded section of European society uh, should be taking from the Portuguese results? Right. Well, uh, Portugal is just the last of a long series of European countries that joined uh, the long list uh, of, of countries where the populist radical right is very successful in elections. Uh, this is the case even in Germany. Germany is a country that traditionally was considered exceptional precisely because of the memory of the Holocaust, of the Nazi past, and how much the whole country swore to never repeat that dramatic past again. Now, if even in Germany we have a party like IFD at almost 20%, exactly like Chile and Portugal, it means that something in the transmission of memory has been broken across Europe, not just in Portugal, not just in Germany. Uh, another lesson from, from Portugal is that if the liberal parties, the mainstream right and the mainstream left, don't manage to offer an alternative to these affected citizens, to people who are dissatisfied with the way democracy works, the populist radical right will always manage to mobilize its electorate. So it's not enough to say, vote for us because otherwise the populist radical right will get in power. This never works. This is exactly what happens before the populist radical right gets to power. Hmm. So it's about two things. It's about the transition of memory, but also about the ability to articulate a vision of the future. Absolutely. It's about learning from the past and make sure that some tragic mistakes are not repeated. But it's also about the future. It's also about giving to the citizens something to vote for and not just something to vote against. Liberal parties have to give to citizens 
policies, ideas, perspectives, uh, and not just an enemy to vote against. Well, Luca Menucci, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I was talking to Portuguese academic Luca Menucci from the University of Lisbon's Institute of Social Sciences. His books, Populism and Collective Memory and The Populism Interviews, are both published by Routledge. Now, it's the week of presidential elections in Russia. But I don't think that I'll be risking my career here if I predict that next week the Russian president will still be one Vladimir Putin. The elections, held over three days across Russia's 11 time zones, are being tightly controlled, with opposition candidates barred from running. So, how to cover an event where the outcome is already a foregone conclusion? Well, here at Inside Europe, we decided to focus on the ideas that are not on the ballot instead. So we reached out to people representing different strands of Russian civil society in exile and asked them to imagine themselves forwards into a future Russia where change really is on the ballot. My name is Lola Nordic. I'm an activist, eco-feminist, artist from St. Petersburg. I'm a co-founder of a feminist anti-war resistance movement. One day I will vote in a Russia where every political prisoner is free, where women and children are protected from domestic violence, where homophobic and transphobic laws are abolished and queer people can live their lives openly and be safe, where fossil fuel industry is banned, is no longer the main resource for economy and the sustainable green energy is developed where indigenous communities are no longer victims of Kremlin's colonial violence, where criminals no longer rule the country. My name is Alexey Voloshinov. I'm 22 year old, I'm originally from Russia, Moscow. I'm a journalist currently working on Deutsche Welle and that's what I got to say. One day, I will vote in Russia where no one's afraid, where every kid from the age of 17 won't have to come up with the schemes of how to avoid going to the front line, where Russian people won't have to know the difference between the sound of air defense and missile rocket launch system, where people won't have to know how to get payments for combat injuries, what room is the best place to hide during bombings, who falls under the first, second and third waves of mobilization what words can be written on social network and what words cannot, how to save money on food and how to write off utility debts and how to get the residence permit in any of countries bordering Russia. I believe that one day I will vote in Russia that will be home for me and for my children in Russia where tomorrow exists. My name is Ilya Matveyev. I'm a political scientist. For seven years, I taught at a university in St. Petersburg, and now I'm a visiting scholar at University of California, Berkeley. One day I will vote in a Russia where elections are free and fair, where candidates are not killed, like Alexei Navalny, who was a presidential candidate in 2018, where candidates are not blocked from participating in presidential elections, where there are genuine debates between candidates because Vladimir Putin never participated in a debate in his life, in a political debate. Uh, I will vote in a country where there is free speech, where journalists are not persecuted, where there are no uh, fabricated criminal cases that precede presidential elections in order to teach everyone a lesson that uh, we all need to be quiet and, uh, you know, the perennial candidate needs to be re-elected uh, by a wide margin. So 
I will vote in a country where elections are free and fair and democracy is respected. And of course, I will uh, fight for such a country. I will fight for this kind of future for Russia. Ilya Matviev ending that montage of speculative political utopias. And no, that is not something that I get to say often. Our Russian coverage continues in just a minute. Before that, just time to remind you of our feedback address, Inside Europe at dw.com. We love hearing from you with your comments and ideas for the show, so please do drop us a line. And alternatively, of course, you can always leave us a comment or a rating on whichever podcast platform you use. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe. Conscious of the large numbers of Russians who have left the country in opposition to the war in Ukraine, Russian authorities have taken steps to hinder voting by citizens living abroad. These measures have included the cancellation of online voting options and a reduction in polling places. Added to that, of course, is the unspoken fear that by entering a Russian embassy to vote, political dissidents may be running the risk of interrogation or detention. Levi Bridges has been in the Kazakh city of Almaty, where he's found that many of the city's new Russian residents have no expectation of returning home anytime soon. Inside a small theater in Almaty, a group of young Russians are preparing to shoot a scene for an independent film. Young men dressed as circus performers mill about a stage strewn with hay. Thick fog from a smoke machine wafts through the air. This is the two-act theater. Most nights, Russian migrants and local Kazakhs put on plays here, often with political themes. It was founded last year by Vitaly Shingereev and his wife, Yulia, two Russians from the central part of the country. Sitting in a rehearsal room, Shingereev tells me that when Russia invaded Ukraine, it felt deeply personal. His wife has family from Ukraine. Shingereev admits he didn't know anything about Kazakhstan. He and his wife came here only because it was the closest country to where they lived in Siberia. But moving here turned out to be a great decision. Even though Kazakhstan was once colonized by Russia, and many people here don't support Russia's war, locals offered Shingereev's family food and financial assistance. And they volunteered to help them start a new theater. I didn't plan on working in the theater here. I thought I'd end up shoveling coal or working as a janitor or something. Starting this theater wouldn't have been possible without help from local people. Lots of Russians I meet here say they didn't want to leave their homes and families in Russia, but with time, they're also adapting and finding community here. In a cafe, I meet a Russian man from St. Petersburg named Alexander Novikov. He says the weather here is great. It's so much warmer than Russia. And there's just a more relaxed pace of life. But it's still hard because he has a son in Russia who lives with his former partner. His child has only been able to visit him here once. And he still has to grow up in Putin's Russia. Novikov says years ago, back before Russia's invasion, his son made a comment in school saying Putin wasn't a great guy. And the teachers told him not to say things like that. It's very sad that even a five-year-old child can understand what is happening in Russia today. Adult Russians having all the tools in the world, the internet, books, experts, are poisoned by propaganda. But a child, I guess, has a clean brain. 
Being separated from family is really hard for Russians who fled their country. Alexander Chichkov is a lawyer from Siberia who provides legal assistance to Russians here. He says the long-term effects of the war are taking a toll on Russian migrants. One of the biggest things Russians here need right now is psychological support. Because getting separated from your home and having to find a new one is really difficult. It's hard for me too. Lots of Russians here are young men who left home because they feared getting drafted. But many women left Russia too. At a cafe in Bishkek, the capital of the nearby country of Kyrgyzstan, I meet a young Russian woman who didn't want to give her name because she fears getting in trouble with the Russian authorities for speaking about the war. She's still being careful, but she feels so much freer here. In Russia, talking about the war in school seemed too risky. I was feeling that if I talked with my peers, uh, someone could hear me and just talk to my teachers. Teachers will talk to my parents and they'll go to jail. She was finishing high school when the war started, and she just gotten accepted to her dream university. Coming here, she lost that opportunity. And sometimes I think like I'm losing this uh, student life, but then I remember, okay, uh, here is much better, and I'm happy that I choose to move. <laughs> Her mother says she felt helpless in Russia because it seemed impossible to change anything under Putin. We were just like uh, watching a play in a theater, that's all. That's what it felt like, like you're just watching something and you can't control what's happening. Yeah, and uh, I understood that I don't want to watch it anymore. You know, a movie or a play, I want to leave. I want to leave the show and I want to go somewhere else. Back at the two-act theater, a crowd of young people socialize near the stage. In cities like Almaty, Russians feel like they can control the show, both figuratively and literally. The theater's director, Vitaly Shingarev, has even staged a play here about the war, based on the experiences of Russian migrants. I feel like everything you can do in this theater would be impossible in Russia. We put on plays by authors who have also left Russia, who wrote about the conflict and other themes that are banned there. If I had done this in Russia, the authorities would have already put me away for a long time. The theater has started staging performances in both Russian and Kazakh, which is attracting a diverse audience of Russians and locals. Recently, they had their first sold-out show. Levi Bridges, DW, Almaty, Kazakhstan. Now, it's time for... Elections were also the theme of our Spotify poll last week. We'd wanted to know which European country had the dubious distinction of having taken until 1984 to give women the vote. And here I have to set the record straight. It was Liechtenstein, although admittedly none of the other countries we gave as options exactly covered themselves in glory on this one either. This week, we're celebrating the Oscars and, in particular, the best documentary win for Ukrainian journalist Mstislav Chernov's 20 Days in Mariupol. Probably I will be the first director on this stage who will say, I wish I would never made this film. Mr. Slav Chernov there. Head over to Spotify for an Oscar-themed edition of our weekly quiz. <laughs> I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe.
This is Inside Europe and I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. Stay with us. Our elections-related coverage is not over yet. Important decisions are afoot in both Serbia... For the opposition, for Serbia against violence, they'll be able to say, look, we came close last time when we believed that the polls were seriously rigged. If we can get a good turnout this time, then perhaps we can go on from there. And Turkey... The authorities are willing to just clamp down on free speech, but the media, social media companies themselves are not robust enough in standing up to this pressure. We'll be unpicking it all for you in just a minute. Then later in the programme, we'll be covering the alarming incidents of food poverty in the UK. You will get people that come in here and are crying and they they stand outside the door and they're too nervous to come in. And then you'll get people that just use it as a community that come in, that they feel really comfortable. They will take the food, take the help, and they're really grateful and really appreciative of what everybody here does. And Olympic preparations in Paris's urban melting pot neighbourhood of Saint-Denis. That's all still to come. From Bonn, Germany, you're listening to Inside Europe. Citizens of Serbia's capital, Belgrade, will have to vote again for a new municipal government. The announcement of a rerun for the city assembly follows months of allegations of vote rigging at last December's polls. At the same time, Serbia's long-serving Prime Minister, Anna Branovic, is spending her last few days as head of government, while President Aleksandr Vucic chooses his new cabinet. Earlier, I was joined by our Balkans correspondent, Guy Delaunay, and I put it to him that there was quite a lot to unpick. Oh, indeed there is. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will be asking, first of all, you know, why is a local election, in essence, such a big deal? And this is the election for for Belgrade City Assembly. And the fact is that Belgrade, when you look at Serbia, is has an outsized influence. So in a country of about six and a half million people, there's about two million people live in the Belgrade metropolitan area. So if you've got control of Belgrade City Assembly, then you've got a lot of influence in the country. And the things that you do within Belgrade can set the tone for other things that happen in the country. And if you're an opposition which has been out of power for the past 12 years nationally, the past decade in terms of Belgrade, then this is your foothold back into regaining at least some power from the Progressive Party of President Aleksandr Vucic, who've been dominating the political scene in Serbia uh, since 2012. Right, OK. Now, the Belgrade municipal elections, they've been held before, very recently. Why the rematch? Well, they were held just in December, so that's just a matter of, of three months ago. I was in Belgrade on the day, and I remember this vividly. Um, we were getting reports about voters being bussed in to Belgrade to vote in the municipal elections who were coming in on buses from Bosnia, from various other cities in Serbia, from Kosovo. And the opposition and independent monitors reckoned that the number of these people who are being bussed in numbered tens of thousands, and certainly enough to have a material impact on the result of the Belgrade city elections. Now, as it happens, we ended up with a hung assembly, no party with overall control, and the governing party, the progressives, couldn't cobble together a coalition uh, that would give them overall control. They had a couple of goes at it, they didn't succeed, so now we're moving forward to fresh elections. But of course, in the background, it's, it's not just about that, We've been getting a lot of pressure from not just local election monitors and opposition activists, but also international election monitors. You know, the government would say that that hasn't had any influence on proceedings. And indeed, Prime Minister Anna Banovic denies, of course, that there's been any funny business. After months of instability and crisis created by lies and nonsense, this report finally puts an end to it. The government of the Republic of Serbia harshly condemns all those who abused public resources in the media and, thanks to various geopolitical interests, used all that in recent months to attack their own country. 
za napad na sobstvenu zemlju. Well, I want to zoom in on Anna Branovic uh, in a moment, Guy, but for the moment, uh, can you just give me a sense of how the opposition are feeling? Well, the opposition now, I mean, they've got what they wanted, which is fresh elections being held. And they're keen to say that this isn't a rerun of December's election, it's a fresh election. They had been trying to get international support for their position over the past few weeks. There were protests earlier in the year as well, after the elections initially. Um, They've been going around European capitals, talking to political leaders from EU member states and also going to Brussels as well. And what they want now are guarantees about the integrity of the fresh vote. And this vote is going to take place in June. So it's it's a few months away yet. So there is actually time for the conditions for free and fair elections to be put in place. And I've been speaking to Dobrica Veselinovic from the Green Left Front, which is part of the Serbia Against Violence Coalition. And in fact, he was their list holder uh, for the election in December, meaning he was top of the candidate list. The highest importance is that we go and start to fixing the broken political and democratic system with the elections, that we start with opening the voter registry, which is not open and not transparent, that we can see how the changes in the residence permits and the moving of the people happen, to start working on the improvements and uh, uh, fixing the irregularities in the media sphere, especially with this regulatory body for uh, electronic media, which is not existing now, and also preventing extensively using of the state and the the, the city resources to campaign for the public officials and also to stop pressuring the votes and buying the votes of the citizens. One thing that will be different uh, is the Prime Minister. Anna Branovic is bowing out as PM after seven years. Why and why now? So this has been a move which has been expected for some time. Anna Banovic is now the longest serving prime minister in Serbia's history. So she has been in office for a fair amount of time. And Mr Vucic has, you know, got, I would imagine, other people that he wants to uh, engage in the government and other people that he will want to ensure are close to him as allies. So it's a case of this being the good move for Mr Vucic right now and how he wants to assemble his new cabinet. Now, Anna Barnabic isn't going to disappear. She's going to go to become the Speaker of Parliament. At least that's what Mr Vucic has announced, and the Progressive Party have given their support for this. Um, That was meant to happen a few days ago, but there's been a hold-up because there are all sorts of constitutional questions about whether the Prime Minister should actually be an MP at the moment, and is that constitutionally correct for her not to have resigned as an MP while still acting in a technical capacity as Prime Minister. So it's a little bit complicated and it's taking a little bit of time to work out. So for the moment, she's still in the Prime Minister's office, but it's probably only for a matter of days. Finally, Guy, the battle for Belgrade, it's on again. How do you think that is being viewed by people in the city itself? I mean, is there a sense of excitement, a sense that this time it might go differently to in December? Or is there sort of weariness and cynicism setting in? Definitely voter fatigue. I mean, we have so many elections in Serbia. We've got parliamentary polls coming around every couple of years in Serbia. And we had the municipal elections as well last December for a lot of the country. More municipal elections scheduled for this year. Now the Belgrade City Assembly rerun also scheduled for this year. Voter fatigue is definitely an issue. That means that I think both sides are going to have to work to get their voter bases back out again. For the opposition, for Serbia Against Violence, they'll be able to say, look... We came close last time when we believed that the the polls were seriously rigged. If we can get a good turnout this time, and if even some of these assurances by the government uh, that they'll assure a free and fair vote are met, then perhaps we've got a chance of forming a majority in the city assembly, and we can go on from there. For the Progressive Party, of course, they've got a a very well-organised party machine. They're the best organised, best funded party in the country, which also has all the advantages of being in government. And as I was saying earlier, we've heard those allegations by the 
international monitors that public resources are used for party activities for the progressive party so they've got a lot of advantages so i think it's going to be a battle over the next few months by the parties to enthuse and engage their voters and impress upon them the importance of these the, these fresh polls uh, because and the side which manages to do that better will probably end up winning in june Well, as we said at the beginning, a lot to unpick in Serbia at the moment. Thank you so much for joining me and doing that so skillfully for us, Guy. It's a pleasure. Our Balkans correspondent, Guy Delaunay, there. Now, in terms of municipal election stakes, Belgrade is to Serbia what Istanbul is to Turkey. And, as chance would have it, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is currently leading an intense battle to regain control of the city in hotly contested local elections this month. But opposition media are warning about the tactics being employed, including deep fake videos in campaign ads. International rights groups are voicing alarm over what they claim are social media companies' willing compliance with Turkish censorship as the authorities crack down on access to international news providers. So, who will win the battle for Istanbul? Well, at present, the polls indicate that it is still too close to call. From Istanbul, Dorian Jones reports. This artificial generated video is circulating in social media. It shows incumbent Istanbul Mayor Ekrem İmamoğlu praising Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan for his achievements in Istanbul. İmamoğlu is a prominent opposition leader. Opinion polls indicate it's a tight contest in the city's elections, and independent media warn of the threat of such fake news. Most mainstream media is under government control and not verifying the authenticity of videos such as this one. Hikmet Adal is a social media journalist at BNET, an independent news portal. You can produce deep fake videos and publish them as advertisements. They're not usually posted on news sites, but they reach millions of people as advertisements. And if you ask some people if Ikram Imamulu actually said this, they say he did, because they follow the mainstream media. <laughs> During last year's presidential elections, Erdogan used a video falsely showing his opponent, Kamal Kılıçdaroğlu, with leaders of the Kurdish separatist group, the PKK, which is fighting the Turkish government. Yaman Akdeniz is with the Freedom of Expression Association. He fears more fake news videos as election day draws closer. I believe we will witness more of these uh, leading into the uh, local elections which is, of course, a major concern. And there were some examples of that uh, prior to the May 2023 general elections. Uh, A photo of the uh, opposition leader, uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, uh, appeared with PKK uh, leaders. Even the president of Turkey commented on that, saying that he knows that it is fake, but still uh, they use it. Turkey's small independent media sector, which is so important to exposing fake news, is facing increasing pressure from the authorities, with much of its news blocked on social media. This month, 22 international rights groups criticise social media for being too willing to comply with Ankara's demands for the removal of posts. Emma Sinclair Webb is a senior researcher with Human Rights Watch. What we've seen is that very, very often material is removed and blocked online, social media content, news content mainly. So it's a very concerning to see that the authorities are willing to just clamp down on free speech, but the media, social media companies themselves are not robust enough in standing up to this pressure. We want them to be more transparent and to work together in raising concerns about requests by Turkey to block content that is clearly within the boundaries of free expression, also to contest such orders in court in Turkey. A new disinformation law is resulting in more prosecutions of independent media, adding to the pressure they're facing. Many Turks are now turning to international news platforms. 
but the authorities are now blocking internet access to foreign news sources like Deutsche Welle and Voice of America, which broadcast in Turkish. These portals are only accessible by Virtual Private Network, or VPN, which circumvents the ban. But now, some of the most widely used VPNs are also facing restrictions. Antonio Cesaro of Proton, a VPN provider. Restricting access to internet has become a sort of playbook for regimes and authoritarian governments. So we see across the world an increase in VPN usage, uh, especially in countries like Turkey. Governments like Turkey will uh, always try to have some sort of control over the media and uh, they will keep trying blocking technologies uh, that let people bypass those blocks. It's a cat and mouse game. So we will try our best to keep fighting, to keep investing in technology that can uh, bring people back online. Back at independent news provider BNet, social media editor Hikmet Adal warns they're losing the battle to identify fake news. It's not possible for us to fight against this. Our teams are very limited. 20 people, maybe just 15. But there's an army behind fake news. With opinion polls indicating the Istanbul election too close to call, analysts warn that fake news is likely to grow in the run-up to the polls later this month, along with the pressure on independent news. Dorian Jones, DW, Istanbul. Our colleagues at DW's Turkish service are of course working hard to provide reliable news and analysis in the run-up to the upcoming municipal elections in Istanbul. Turkish-speaking listeners can follow them on DW Turka and for everyone else there is of course DW's breaking news app. For more coverage from our very own Dorian Jones, make sure that you are subscribed to Inside Europe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You are listening to Inside Europe. This week in the UK, a group of mothers went on hunger strike outside Parliament in London to highlight the level of food poverty in the country. More than half of the people who depend on state benefits now say they cannot afford enough food to feed themselves and their families. As a result, thousands of volunteers work with food banks and social enterprises in an attempt to plug the gaps, although they hope that one day they will no longer be needed. Lars Bavanga reports from Manchester. <laughs> it's morning at the Emmanuel Church, home to one of Greater Manchester's nearly 300 food banks. The mood amongst the volunteers is good, but the reason why they are here is not at all joyful. Natasha Livingston is one of those helping out. You will get people that come in here and are crying and they, they stand outside the door and they're too nervous to come in. And then you'll get people that just use it as a community, that come in, that they feel really comfortable. They will take the food, take the help, and they're really grateful and really appreciative of what everybody here does. There are more than 2,500 food banks in the whole of the UK. This one, and more than 1,300 others, are run by the Trussell Trust charity. Their latest statistics show that more than half of people in the UK who depend on state benefits cannot afford enough food. Paul Harris is the assistant manager at the Trussell Trust's Salford Food Bank. It started off as a small... Um, service to help a few people in a community who are in need and has just seen um, drastic growth, um, especially over the last few years, um, just trying to help people in the community and the amount of people there are that need help has um, unfortunately gone up so much um, that food banks are having to do a lot more. 
We know there will be difficult decisions ahead, but working together, I know we can take the country through those difficult times to the better times that I believe lie ahead. In 2010, the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition government under David Cameron came to power. That year, 60,000 people used food banks. Today, the figure is more than 3 million. Charities like the Trussell Trust say cuts to welfare spending to the tune of 35 billion euro introduced from 2010 is one of the main reasons for this increase. The current Conservative government blames the war in Ukraine and Covid and says that since 2010 it has doubled the number of children receiving free school meals and lifted 1.7 million people out of poverty. Looks like a nice space for a sauce, is that right? Lots of yes, onions. so it's uh, onions. Um, Yet the number of people volunteering to help those in need is growing. Mary Ellen McTague is one of the UK's top chefs with Michelin star pedigree. She's also one of the founders of Eat Well Manchester, a non profit collective of chefs donating time to cook high quality meals for people in need. Eat Well Manchester is all about taking meals to people who are facing hardship for various reasons. So it might be people facing economic hardship, it might be women in refuges, it could be parents of children who are in long-term hospital stays, but with all sorts of people. We work uh, entirely with chefs and restaurants, so we, we um, get the people within our collective to create lovely um, meals. They'll be a treat, they'll be delicious and we will then distribute these meals to various cohorts around Manchester. Mary Ellen and her team have cooked up well over 100,000 meals so far. Today, she's cooking with other chefs at a central Manchester restaurant kitchen, which has been made available for this purpose. It's absolutely important for us that the meals that we take out are of a really high quality. Uh, That doesn't mean the need to be sort of fine dining, fancy dishes. It could be a cottage pie, it could be a pasta dish. Uh, It just needs to be made with the same quality ingredients and love and care and attention as those chefs would make a meal in their restaurant. Everybody deserves access to good food. It's it's part of of restoring that sense of self-worth as well, perhaps. Absolutely. It's. I mean, we all know what it's like if you've had a, a, a tough day to get home and someone's prepared a meal for you. I mean, it's, it's a universally comforting, reassuring and pleasant experience. And that is something that a lot of people don't have access to on a regular basis. The opposition Labour Party says it wants to end the need for food charities by 2030 by introducing what it calls a national minimum, a duty on the state to preserve certain standards of living nobody should be allowed to fall below. Labour does look set to win power later this year. But with an economy that is currently in recession and with a public sector net debt of close to 100% of GDP, there are no quick fixes on the horizon for the millions of UK residents who depend on food aid. Lars Bevanger, DW, Manchester. Many of the residents of Paris's Saint-Denis neighbourhood will be no stranger to poverty either. Saint-Denis, which has one of the highest immigrant origin populations in France, is often associated in French minds with urban problems, drugs, crime and riots in particular. It's also, however, home to the national stadium, Stade de France, and now the Olympic Village. With the Games now only just a few months away, John Lawrenson has been talking to local residents and getting the lie of the land. Getting on for two years ago, Saint-Saint-Denis made a bit of a name for itself. There's hundreds of people running around, we causing came, trouble. Came from Somebody snatched his ticket out of his hand. When Liverpool football fans waiting to get into the Stade de France before being tear-gassed by the police and accused of hooliganism by the interior minister were attacked by hundreds of local youths as they told the Parisian newspaper. They had my wife by her hair. She was screaming, she was asking for help. At this point, I'm, I'm concussed. I've got blood pouring out of my head. I don't want to go back to France. Do not go to the Olympics. And emerging from the metro in Saint-Denis is not very reassuring either, mainly because of the number of guys hanging around who really don't look like they're waiting for their girlfriends. But more than a bit of the unease is due to what me and most of the other 68 million people who live in France carry round in our heads about the banlieue or suburbs in general, and this one in particular. 
possibly involving images of burning cars and crack dealers in hoodies. So much so that the idea of an agency for the development of tourism in Seine-Saint-Denis would strike many as some sort of joke, and yet it exists, and its director, Olivier Meyer, is waiting for me just a couple of hundred metres away. La crypte des tombeaux. The Saint-Saint-Denis Cathedral Basilica is one of the first Gothic cathedrals and, incredible fact, the remains of the kings and queens of France are here. Last year we had 100,000 visitors. That's nothing compared to the over 12 million a year who visited Notre-Dame de Paris before the fire. Here, we are a few minutes by metro from Paris, 10 minutes by foot from the Stade de France, 10 minutes from the Olympic pool, 15 minutes from the Olympic Village. So we hope that at last the Cathedral Basilica will start to get the number of visitors it deserves. One of the main reasons few visitors come now, he says, is Saint Saint Denis's image. But in fact, the last available figures show crime rates are as high in the centre of Paris as they are here. At the local market, most people say the reality is not so bad and they hope to prove it during the Olympics. People shouldn't worry. Saint-Saint-Denis is like everywhere else in France. There is good and bad. I've been living here since 1958 and nobody's ever shown me a lack of respect. And you want to hear a good one? The butcher, an Algerian in his early 30s, he calls me granny. Anyway, last time I wasn't there, he cut a strip of liver for me and gave it to me, saying, and that's a bit of extra, because you need to keep your strength up. Where else would you get that? Uh, whenever I tell a colleague that I live in Saint-Saint-Denis, the way they see me changes. Sometimes, when I find a girlfriend on Tinder, as soon as I say I live in Saint-Saint-Denis, she blocks me. She blocks So are they right, these people, or are they wrong? For me, they are a bit right, because there is a lot of violence here. People think there is more insecurity here, because there are more foreigners, but it's the same everywhere. On the contrary, we foreigners are very welcoming. Are you going to give a good welcome to the thousands of visitors who are going to come here? Of course. Don't you feel safe now? A very warm welcome to you. Inshallah, you'll be safe with us, brother. Inshallah, you are in security, la preuve. On the bus, testing out the transport infrastructure. Opinion polls say Parisians are a bit iffy about the Olympics. Paris is expecting a record 15 to 16 million visitors this summer. The transport system is already critically overcrowded, so people are legitimately concerned about overload. But those polls show a big difference in Seine-Saint-Denis, where 80% of people are enthusiastic. It's partly about money. A French parliamentary report concluded the Games will bring between 5 and 10 billion euros of revenue, around a third from extra tourism. One major subject of cafe conversation at the moment is who's going to try to make a fast euro by renting out a room for the Olympics, with Airbnb quoting prices four, five, six times higher than usual. Merci bien to John Lawrenson for that report and bon chance to all athletes and, just as importantly, to the residents of Saint-Denis. That's it for this week's show. Just a quick reminder that our feedback address is insideeurope at dw.com. Please do get in touch if you have any comments on the show or if there are topics that you'd like to hear us cover or cover differently or better or voices that you'd like to hear represented in the show. This episode was produced by Helen Sini with help from me, Kate Laycock, and sound engineers Jürgen Kuhn and Ziad Abu Sleiman. Inside Europe comes to you from DW in Bonn, Germany. 